Hello, my name is Chan Mei Yeok. I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist from KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. Today, my talk is on palliative ethics. It is a huge topic, um, and I propose to structure the scope of the talk such. First, I will define what is palliative care and what is palliative ethics before discussing some ethical issues in palliative care. There are many ethical issues in palliative care, but I've chosen to concentrate on these four. Transition from curative care and the issue of abandonment, decision-making in palliative care, medical futility and inappropriate therapies, and finally, end-of-life care, particularly talking about euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, and palliative sedation. Some of the topics that I will be discussing are contentious uh, and controversial, and there are polarizing views on either side. The opinions expressed here are my own, but I've also tried to put in other differing viewpoints where possible. First, what is palliative care? Palliative care is a subspecialty in medicine that focuses on improving the quality of life for patients who are seriously ill and or have a life-limiting condition. Some of these patients may be at the end of life, but not all. Indeed, palliative care is not limited to just patients at the end of life. The goals of palliative care broadly are to provide relief from physical symptoms like pain and breathlessness, it also aims to support emotional, mental, and spiritual issues. And finally, it wants to be comprehensive and holistic as far as possible. Palliative ethics pertains to the moral and ethical issues surrounding palliative care. Now, people will ask, why is there a distinction between ethics surrounding palliative care and ethics surrounding general medical care? During palliative care, it is a vulnerable and emotional time for patients and their families. They are often um, at the end of, of life or the chance of uh, dying is very high. And often div difficult decisions have to be made about what the best cause of action is. And sometimes these decisions result in a life and death situation. And it's made worse by the fact that there's no one right answer or choice. More often, it is about personal values and goals rather than hard medical facts provided by the physicians. There are also societal implications uh, in the issues surrounding palliative ethics. Religious and cultural values have to be considered, particularly during policy making. And finally, although, palliative, um, although ethics in other medical conditions may or may not occur in, in everyone, Death is universal, and the issues surrounding it will affect us all at some point. So the first issue I'd like to discuss is transitioning to palliative care. Now, this can be a very difficult time for patients and medical team as well. It can be fraught with prognostic paralysis, in that it is very difficult sometimes for the, the physician to prognosticate when the patient is likely dying. There's also the fear of the unknown by the uh, patients because the patient may have to be transitioned to an unknown team, the, med the palliative care team, sometimes to an unknown place like a hospice or a different ward in the, in the hospital. There's also the fear of giving up both on the part of the physician as well as the patient. And finally, there's the fear of abandonment by the patient, uh, by the primary team. Uh, sorry, the fear of abandonment that the patient feels that the primary team is, is uh, uh, doing. Patients who have chronic illnesses or serious illnesses often have a long relationship with their primary medical team. And when the time comes for transition to the palliative care team, patients often feel that they are being abandoned by their primary medical team because of the fact that they are not curable. So therefore, empath empathetic communication is very important and it must be uh, conducted at the patient's pace as far as possible. Care must be taken not to 
abandon the patient or family or not to appear to abandon the patient and the family. And so therefore, it is very important for the medical team to be available, if not physically, by visiting the patient in either the different ward or in the hospice, uh, then you can also communicate by email or calls, etc. But this brings the importance of integrative care in the sense that palliative care really should be integrated into the total care of the patient. This is the traditional model of care where a patient, once diagnosed, will have curative aggressive care by the medical team until all curative options are exhausted and then is abruptly switched to palliative care, often with a new medical team and maybe at a different place of care. This sudden change often leads the patient to feel abandoned by the, the primary medical team. And the palliative care team often have a difficult time building rapport with the patient and the family. The primary medical team also may not want to be seen as giving up or trying to cure the patient, or the patient may not want to stop curative treatment. And so this leads to the, the fact that uh, the patient is often referred to the palliative care very late, often too late for the palliative care team to uh, have any uh, to be able to do any effective or meaningful interventions. This is the ideal form of care that we should see, where integration of palliative care is started right from the beginning, where, the di where at diagnosis of a serious illness, the palliative team is brought into the care of the, the total care of the patient. The need for palliative care then varies depending on the patient's condition. When the illness progresses, the need for palliative care increases, while the part played by curative care then decreases. Palliative care will continue into bereavement care for the family after the death of the patient. So this is the ideal form of palliative care integration into the total care of the patient. However, some patients may not be so receptive to the presence of the palliative care team, in part due to the perception that having the palliative care on board implies that the patient is at the end of life. So some ethical dilemmas pertaining to true transition would include things like, should patients be given a choice whether to refer to palliative care at all? Indeed, should palliative care be called something else to make it more palatable to some patients. For example, instead of calling it palliative care team, you can call it symptom care team or supportive care team. Does this constitute collusion though? And is it ever ethical to participate in collusion? Now, if we say that it is the ethical uh, right of patients to be respected because they are, they are able to make their own decisions and doctors are supposed to respect patients and their choices, then it follows that patients should be given a choice whether or not to refer to palliative care. However, it is important that all information is given to um, the family to make them understand that palliative care does not equate to end-of-life care or hospice care, and that palliative care encompasses not just end-of-life, but it also encompasses care during the time of a crisis in, in a severe illness. So therefore, it is very important for truth-telling uh, on the part of the physicians. And if you were to um, call a palliative care team by another name, are we doing any favours to the patient? Uh, is it, are we just um, whitewashing the truth? It is also important for us to communicate sensitively. Um, so it is really difficult to justify collusion in this case, especially in the case of our society in Asia, where a lot of times families do not want their loved ones to know they are, uh, that they are seriously ill uh, or that their condition uh, might have a high chance of the patient dying. However, it is it is the right of patients, if we respect them, that they should know what is happening to them. What about patients who are unable to make their own decisions? For example, children or patients who are in a coma. 
In this case, then it's important to consider the best interests of the patient and for the medical team, together with their loved ones, to make the best decision according to the, the wishes of the patient if the patient were to be able to communicate.